I often get asked to cover weird laws. Well, what if I told you there's an archaic maritime law from the 1850s that is still prominently used today, which allows tort forcers to immediately sue the victims of a catastrophe in order to limit the negligent party's exposure and prevent or reduce victims from recovering. What's going on y'all, Attorney Tom here. Today I'm going to be covering the Limitation of Liability Act of 1851. As many of you know, I'm a catastrophic personal injury lawyer. And in the past, my firm has handled maritime injury cases and we are currently handling maritime injury cases. And with that said, maritime injuries are definitely one of the most complex and sometimes archaic areas of the law. This is because maritime laws have been around for a long time, up until only about a hundred years ago, even less really. The only way to move around the world or move cargo around the world was by sea. So maritime laws have existed for centuries and in a legal society that establishes precedent and builds off of that precedent, maritime law has been a cornerstone of the legal community and has been around forever. And on top of that, legislation has been passed from the very, very beginning of the United States about this topic. So even today in 2021, we are still left with a lot of laws that are very, very old and they are still active and dominant in the society. Even though a lot of the laws are definitely outdated, it is still currently the law. And I can't think of a better example of this than the Limitation of Liability Act of 1851. When the Limitation of Liabilities Act was passed, its primary goal was to accomplish two things. One, protect ship owners from financial ruin in the event of a catastrophe on their ship. Back then, it was actually very common to have incidents occur on the ocean. They didn't have weather predicting systems. There's no lines of communications. The technology wasn't that great. They still traveled in wooden ships. So as a result, you would often see ships sinking and a whole bunch of other incidents on a fairly regular basis. The other thing a Limitation of Liabilities Act did was protect workers because the conditions were so dangerous. Oftentimes, workers had to throw cargo on their ship overboard in order to save themselves and protect the ship. And this is because the Limitations of Liability Act essentially limits the ship holder's liability in the event of a catastrophe to the value of the ship plus the cargo. And the thought process behind this was back in the day, in the 1850s, when you could have a mom and pop shipping company, if one ship went under, you had to limit the exposure of said ship to just the value of the ship plus the cargo. This was enabled to promote maritime activity, to bolster American trade, and make sure that America could blossom into the world superpower that it became by making trade more profitable and less risky. But remember, this law was passed in the 1850s and it most definitely served its purpose 170 years ago. But in the last 50 years or so, the Limitation of Liability Act has completely flipped from a law meant to protect small ship owners and protect workers and promote trade to a law that is the backbone of major corporations defense and reduction in liability in the event of a catastrophe that they cause. As I've said before, a Limitation of Liability Act limits the exposure of a vessel owner to the value of the vessel and the cargo on board. So essentially it is in the vessel owner's best interest to assert that their cargo plus the vessel is as little as possible, is as worth the least amount as possible. And that essentially caps the amount of recovery for the victims. And while I would love to tell you guys about the specifics of our case, Kirker Garcia just settled for $1.9 million because it did have a limitation of liability action. There was a confidentiality clause. So I am going to use an example where a limitation of liability was used in the real world that is made 
public. On October 1st, 2015, a cargo ship, the El Ferrero, carrying 33 people sunk off the coast. All 33 people died. This is one of the biggest maritime lawsuits in history with modern equipment and modern weather forecasting and communications. This should have never happened. This was gross negligence in my opinion. 33 people died because this ship was in a bad spot, failed to prevent themselves from being in that spot, failed to have working equipment and ultimately cost the lives of every single person on board. So let's work through the Limitation of Liabilities Act from FrightWaves.com. This was posted as the case was unfolding, not at the conclusion of it while it was going on. And this is clearly a pro freight maritime corporation website. Let's dissect this article. The owners of Tote Maritime Puerto Rico container and roll on roll off cargo ship El Ferrero who sank in Hurricane Joaquin on October 1st filed a request for exoneration or limitation of liability in the U.S. District Court of Florida on Friday. In the court filing, Tote and the sister companies prior to the commencement of its last voyage and at all times say they exercise due diligence, which is bullshit, <laughs> to the supply of the ship which suitable engines, machinery, apparel, appliances, personnel, and other appropriate and necessary equipment all in good order and condition for suitable and intended operations, except for having your cargo ship go into a hurricane. They say the captain of the ship monitored hurricane walking and altered the course of the ship to account for the hurricane's expected track. The filing seeks to take advantage of the Ship Owners Limitation of Liability Act of 1851, a law that was enacted to help U.S. ship owners compete with companies based in other countries such as Great Britain and allows ship owners to seek exoneration from or limit their liability in the event of a maritime accident. One advantage of a limitation of liability proceeding is that the court sets a period of time for claims to be filed and orders a consensus of all claims that the forces of all claimants into a single proceeding in federal district court rather than making the company subject to litigation in multiple jurisdictions. Let me explain that to you. Do you know how they do this? They sue the victims. The only way to enact a limitation of liability act is to sue the victims of the incident. And essentially it flips the statute of limitations. Normally, when you are the victim of somebody else's negligence, there is a statute of limitations where you, the victim, can decide whether or not to bring a case. In most states, it's two years. Some will have three, some have four, some have one, some have five, some have six. It just depends. But the victim brings the suit. Here, in the wake of death, in the wake of a catastrophe, days after these incidents happen, companies file a limitation of liability lawsuit. They sue the victims and put them on the clock in order to rush into the litigation process, consolidate, and essentially reduce the total amount of potential financial compensation that is available. Let's keep going. According to the court filing, the value of the El Ferrero is zero and the pending freight on board was worth $2.1 million. However, the law also creates supplemental limitation fund used for personal injury and death claims based on gross tonnage of a ship. The tote company says that amounts to 13 $2 million dollars and that combined 15.3 million dollars is expected to be substantially less than the amount which will be claimed for losses and damages meaning the amount demanded by the 33 victims and their families bringing wrongful death lawsuits will definitely exceed 15.3 million but we're gonna cap all of their recovery cumulatively at $15.3 million. And I'm bad at math, but that's less than $500,000 for each family who literally had their loved one killed. But luckily, I know the lawyers who were involved in this case. They are a very respectable law firm based in Houston, like myself. 
And here is their press release about this case on their website. While Tote was insisting that their ship was only worth a small amount of money, thus limiting each family's potential compensation to a pittance, they filed an insurance claim with their insurer for the ship. The value they claimed in their own insurance filing was higher than the value they claimed under the Limitation of Liability Act. In essence, they were hoping to profit from the destruction of their own vessel and the loss of 33 lives. Do you see how crazy this is? And this is a case involving a cargo ship potentially worth tens of millions of dollars. And where's my eye patch? But that's not always the case. Let's give an example where there aren't potentially tens of millions of dollars in assets at play. And by the way, I wear this eye patch because I have a lazy eye in case you haven't noticed. Let's say there is a captain who is terribly unqualified and is a drunk. He works for a maritime shipping corporation and he's operating a hundred thousand dollar tugboat and he's drunk and driving the vessel and he collides with another vessel causing multiple deaths, multiple permanent injuries. Well, the vessel company files a limitation of liability act and they assert that the tugboat is only worth a hundred thousand dollars, even though they are a multinational multi-billion dollar corporation who let a drunk, untrained, unqualified guy captain their vessel. Well, guess what? families, victims, your recovery is limited at a total of $100,000. And that is the Limitation of Liability Act of 1851 as it applies today. It is used all the time immediately after catastrophes by mega corporations to limit their liability. They affirmatively sue the victims of these incidents and put them on the clock. They have to file an answer to the limitation of liability very, very quickly. Or they risk having the limitation of liability run without any protest, without any counter arguments. The job of a lawyer like myself is to get involved in the limitation of liability and say, hey, tugboat company, your tugboat isn't worth $100,000 it's worth $250,000. And that still sucks. The law definitely shouldn't be that way because it's definitely archaic. But that is the current law. And it's kind of one of those things where you have to hire a lawyer to make the best of a terrible situation. Anyway, I'm sorry for the little bit of the rant. I really do hope you found this interesting because it definitely is a weird law. I think it's an outdated law. Obviously, I am biased. I've just seen it play out in a very bad scenario one too many times, whether it be myself or just hearing stories from the community. But as of right now, the Limitation of Liability Act of 1851 is still very prominently used today. But I want to know your thoughts. What are your thoughts about it? Are there any other weird laws that you want me to cover? I am truly glad that you watch this video. I hope you found it interesting. Again, sorry for the rant. I just, I get passionate about these kind of things. Anyway, y'all, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you hit that like button and consider subscribing to this community. We just passed 336,000 subscribers, which is absolutely crazy. All right, talk to y'all later.